So, Vivekananda, he went to Ramakrishna and asked, Can you prove there is God? Ramakrishna asked, Do you have the courage? He hesitated for a moment and he said, Yes, I want to see. And when he came out, all his questions had completely evaporated. You heard of Swami Vivekananda. For those of you who do not know, Vivekananda was the first yogi who came to United States of America in 1893, Chicago. And his guru was Ramakrishna. So, Vivekananda was just eighteen years of age and he was a fiery youth. One day, somebody told him there is this mystic Ramakrishna, you must see him, he has all the answers. You have so many questions, that's where you should go. So he went. He is full, all fired up, full of intellect and full of argument about everything. He's an activist. He's not a spiritual seeker as such. He has no such intentions. Only thing is, he has questions. He's not a conscious seeker yet. He's more like an activist. He's going every place to demolish all the mumbo jumbo that's going on around him. So he went to Ramakrishna and asked, What is this all the time you're talking, God, God? Can you prove there is God? Ramakrishna said, Well, I am the proof. <laughs> just deflated him completely. <laughs> he was expecting all those head-spinning arguments. Ramakrishna said, well, I am the proof. I am here. This is the proof. Then he made the mistake of asking, can you make me experience whatever it is? Ramakrishna asked, do you have the courage? Vivekananda was known to be a very brave man. He hesitated for a moment and he said, Yes, I want to see. Ramakrishna just took his foot and put it on his chest. And Vivekananda did not get up from a samadhi state for hours. And when he came out, all his questions had completely evaporated. After that, he didn't ask a single question. He saw something that he had never imagined in his life. And then he got… the madness caught him. Ramakrishna himself, if he was left to himself, nobody in the world would have ever heard about him because he had no means to communicate with the rest of the world. He had no way of reaching out to people. He was… he was incredible, but not cunning enough to operate with the world. <laughs> Does not have a necessary growth to do anything with the world. So he chose uh, Vivekananda as his vehicle. He took Ramakrishna all over the world. There have been hundreds of Ramakrishnas, but you heard only of one Ramakrishna because uh, of somebody like Vivekananda. In almost every Indian home, generally this picture is there, Hindu monk picture. Everybody thinks Vivekananda is the inspiration. He inspired a whole generation of people. 
He continues to inspire millions of people even today because he was such a fiery human being. Whatever he spoke and whatever he did, in a short span of his life, he died very young at the age of thirty-two. But in that short span, he set fire to a lot of people and created a major institution which is worldwide even today. The Ramakrishna mission is almost everywhere in the world. When I went to Dakshineshwa in Calcutta, Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, his immediate disciples, after he passed away, when they formed this Ramakrishna mission, a new order, Ramakrishna never gave them initiation into monkhood or anything. After he passed away, these people decided that they will dedicate their lives to spreading his message. They came together and they became monks by themselves. They decided their lives must be dedicated to making this message happen. And when they came together and formed a little ashram on the banks of uh, Hooghly in Calcutta, there's a picture of them. They're standing like this next to the river and there's a photograph, somebody took a photograph of them. You must see these men. These are men, okay? They are like fire. So they took it upon themselves, these eight people, and Ramakrishna mission went across the world and spread the message and even today it's one of the most productive spiritual groups, you know, they're still quietly doing their work in their own way. Swami Vivekananda, after his uh, guru Ramakrishna attained Samadhi, he wanted to take his master's message to the West. So, uh, he wants to go and do this, but he wants to seek the permission of Sharada Devi, who was Ramakrishna's wife. She said, uh, Naren, can you give me that knife? She said, I want you to see how you will give the knife. You may go and spread the master's message. To be spiritual has always been also understood as to be gentle. And unfortunately, to be gentle has always been misunderstood and misinterpreted as to be soft or to be weak. The weak are gentle, not by choice, because they're incapable of making a star strong imprint, they're gentle. Gentleness is of value only when it's by choice. You're capable of being violent, but you choose to be gentle. That's of great value. You're incapable of violence. Now you're gentle. That's not of any great value because that's coming from a certain incapability. Today somebody was asking me, Sadhguru, why all the goddesses in India, always they have weapons in their hands <laughs> Why our Bhairavi, though she has eyes, she doesn't have any weapons in her hands. Ten hands and no weapons, because she's done with violence. You see the buffalo, Mahishasa, already conquered. So what needs to be treated brutally has been done. The beast has been killed. 
now there is no need for weapons so all hands free so to bring yourself to this state intense not in a violent manner intense she is intense in victory she is intense in energy she is intense in her ecstasy her intensity is not violence not that she is not capable of it's just that she is done with it in the evolution of one's action if you look at the evolution of action the initial part of the action will always be violent as you become more expert with something you will see the rough edges in your action goes away and it becomes smoother and smoother and there will be no violence in action even a swordsman who is an expert only somebody who is new goes ah like this an expert will just flick it and it's done there is no violence in the action so in the evolution of action she has passed that still intense but in victory energy and ecstasy not in a violent manner there are many symbolisms like that here yeah, if you feel your eyes and see where it is intense but not violent is something wrong with violence it's not a question of right and wrong it's just crude way of conducting life if you say violence is bad that means you will end up rejecting a part of yourself and you can never get rid of it because it'll not go it'll come out in so many ways people who are very peaceful on the street violent at home if they are not capable of physical violence they are verbally violent they are violent in their thought and emotion in so many ways so rejecting violence is not going to work evolving violence into a more sophisticated action the need is not for violence the need is for intensity the need for that intensity is always there in every human being if you do not refine and so refine that need for intensity and manage to experience that intensity by simply sitting in meditativeness or in devotion or in love or in simply pure action if you do not find refinement and still find intensity violence will erupt from you in so many different ways you may not have the courage to get into a physical fight but it will happen in so many different ways and life turns ugly it will enter every sphere of your life and the way you take things and keep things you will know whether you are gentle or violent you know there's a very beautiful incident which happened i must have told you a few times swami vivekananda all of you heard of swami vivekananda after his uh, guru ramakrishna attained samadhi he wanted to take his master's message to the west so uh, he wants to go and do this but he wants to seek the permission of sharada devi who was ramakrishna's wife he went to see her and she was she was busy cooking in the kitchen when he went and said this she was focused on what she was doing without looking up she listened to him 
He said, I want to go to the Western world and spread the message of my master. Shall I go? So without looking up from the chores that she was doing, she said, uh, Naren, can you give me that knife? So he picked up the knife and gave it. He is a certain kind of person, so he gave it in a certain way. Not like that, he gave it in a certain way. She took the knife and kept it aside and she said, you may go. Then he noticed this and he said, why did you ask for the knife? You have no vegetables to cut, everything is already on the pot, already in the pot, on the boil. Why did you ask for the knife? There was no need for the knife, why did you ask for it? She said, I wanted to see how you will give the knife. You may go and spread the master's message. So this is where gentleness is. Not because somebody is watching, not because you are under scrutiny, just the way you move, how you step on the planet, how you breathe, how you sit, how you stand, how you look at other people. This is where you have to refine your action. Now I am not talking to you about mindfulness, no being mindful of everything, no. I am talking about refining your physical action, your verbal action. With this slowly, your mental action and emotional action also can be refined. To so just move your hands and legs in a more gentle manner. This refinement can happen either because you become meditative or you consciously refine it so that you move towards meditativeness. <coughs> it's good to start from both the ends. If you want to reach a destination, <laughs> it's good to start from every possible end so that you get there quick enough. If you want to burn a candle quick, you burn it from both ends, isn't it? You burn it from only an end, one end it may take a lifetime. You want to enjoy at least half a lifetime of meditativeness. You must burn it from both ends. <laughs> so you may be practicing meditation, but also consciously refining your physical action. The way you move your hands, the way you move your body, the way you move your breath, your words. This is not about becoming pretentious. This is about becoming conscious. Sadhguru, what is so wrong about praying for one's mother's health that a guru would never see his disciple again? Ramakrishna saying what he said, for Vivekananda he has said different standards. If Vivekananda had prayed for what he thought he wanted, so Ramakrishna is setting up a, a trajectory for a projectile that he's shooting. Namaskaram Sadhguru, you have told us a beautiful story of Swami Vivekananda and Ramakrishna Par Paramhansa. Swami Vivekananda's mother was seriously ill and Ramakrishna told him that had Vivekananda prayed to Kali for his mother's health, Ramakrishna would never see him again. Sadhguru, what is so wrong about praying for one's mother's health that a guru would never see his disciple again? Now you're exposing how horrible the gurus are. See, there are many aspects to our life. Of these many aspects, a guru means, I know that word guru is being used uh, loosely today, management guru, marketing guru and whatever, whatever. We are not using the word in that context. When we say a guru, we are talking about someone who is committed to the ultimate nature of who you are. 
Well, Ramakrishna saying what he said, he wouldn't have said, said it to all the other hundreds of devotees who are hanging around. He says this only to Vivekananda, you must understand. Because he wouldn't uh, talk about taking your emotions for your mother or your health or uh, <laughs> seeking divine help for your mother's health. For other people, he would have said, okay, go and pray. But for Vivekananda, he has set different standards. Because he's expecting this man to do something much more than what others will do. If he has to do those things, he should not be an asking fool, that he is not somebody who stands in front of the Devi and asks, I want this, I want that. So, for your mother's health, what you… right now, what he that moment needed was money. So he wants to go and ask for money. If money doesn't work, what's the next thing? You ask for a miracle. If miracle doesn't work, what is the next thing? You will ask him to raise the dead. Well, Ramakrishna knows the progression of human mind. Initially, you will say, my mother should be healthy, but she fell ill. Then you will say, I should have the money to get her treated. It didn't work. Then you want a miracle. Simply like that, she became well. Didn't work, she died. Then you want to raise the dead. So Ramakrishna, in one moment, he's seeing through this nature. And above all, he is looking at, he's preparing Vivekananda to be his instrument. And he wants a fine instrument, not a crusty one. So, preparing his instrument, is it more important than Vivekananda's mother? This is not one against the other. But, see today, even you, here in United States, know who was Ramakrishna's guru. Do you know his father's name? Do you know his mother's name? Do you know his uncle, his brother? You know only his guru's name because for Vivekananda, Ramakrishna has become his dharma. He breathes him. But now, social pressure, he is falling back. Should the guru allow him to fall him back or push him forward? This is the question you are asking. Well, I… if I was Vivekananda, I want to be pushed forward, not fall back upon my emotions. And anyway, if there was… if money could save her life, I'm sure Ramakrishna would have provided something. But you're seeking divine help? No, 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 this is something all of you must understand. This has happened a few times around me also, that you initiate somebody into a powerful process, next thing is uh, they want to help their mother or their uncle or their close cousin, little. They want to make him pass examination because the fool has not studied properly. Or they want him to get a lottery. Or they want him to get miraculously sit up in the bed where he is dying. The moment they do that, they will shatter everything within themselves. If… if I am saying, this is a conjecture. If Vivekananda had prayed for what he thought he wanted, where would… well, he would have become a psychological wreck. Absolutely. So it's guru's business to see that that doesn't happen. But twenty-first century, very hard to make them listen. Vivekananda, twentieth century, nineteenth. Nineteenth century only, there was so much trouble.
you can imagine my troubles people will go sit in front of devi and ask all kinds of things because they were doing it with dhyanalinga i put her up and say okay so you have another counter to ask all these things because wherever there is a phenomenal sense of energy which is propelling you forward at a certain space then when you're moving at that speed if you because you're concerned about the tree you held the tree your arm will go you will lose something it will shatter you it will break you so ramakrishna is wanting him to be a rocket and the rocket wants to do this no rocket trajectory is already set you don't try to do this and that that will be a disastrous rocket so in that context he is saying that if you had done this it was finished between you and me because you are anyway a broken failure rocket a failed rocket does anybody go and pick it up you may be thinking it will go to the moon and you fired it but it boof it went into the ocean does anybody go looking for it no it's finished it's over it's burnt up so in that context ramakrishna is saying today if you had done that it was over because it would be not worth seeing you because you would be broken and you're gone what do i do with a broken instrument today you have heard of ramakrishna paramahamsa because of vivekananda if that instrument was broken on that day well ramakrishna's offering to the world would have gone completely waste well i am glad you didn't pick up krishna because krishna said when <laughs> when arjuna said i don't want to kill all these people 100000 men they're talking about krishna said you must kill them then you will realize that is even a worse example but that's a way it is because when you seek ultimate nature when you seek the source of your existence small things arrangements in your existence doesn't mean anything if it means something you do something to somebody not it been because it means something to me let me tell you this today is guru purnima i'll tell you don't tell anybody okay whatever i am doing serving food to people who are starving free education that's going on to thousands of children so health support the health initiatives that are going on for people who are deprived of that and uh, planting trees kaveri all this i am doing because it means a lot to them not because it means anything to me why close my eyes i am done with the world with everybody i am talking not just about you or somebody everybody everybody that means everybody if i close my eyes they are all gone they are dead but i do these things because it means so much to them without fulfilling those things they will never even aspire for anything bigger right now somebody is hungry are you going to talk to him about enlightenment that will be cruel so we feed him not because i get some great satisfaction in feeding him no i have always been saying <laughs> i have no satisfaction in anything that i do including spiritual work whenever people ask me sadguru you must be having so much fulfillment seeing all these people joyful blissful what is my problem they are joyful blissful miserable what's my problem i have no problem because they have a problem i reach out because i didn't see them anything other than other than as myself i reached out that's all but if i shut my eyes i'm done i'm done with the world i'm done with everybody and everything oh so much work has happened people are saying how will you 
Oh, who is your... Uh, who will carry your legacy, Sadhguru? Who will you appoint next? Nobody. If they're interested, they'll carry it on. If they don't think it's valuable, they'll drop it. It's up to them. I'll leave it to them. If they have not seen the value, if people have not seen the value of what's being done, let them drop it and turn it... convert this into a hospital or a school or something. Because that is how most spiritual organizations end up. I don't believe Isha Yoga Center will end up that way because many people have seen the value of it. Even though I constantly nag them, trouble them, create impediments to their work, make their work more and more difficult. This is not for any sadistic satisfaction, just to see how much it means to them. They have proven that it means a lot to them. Life or death, they will do that. Whether I am there or not, they will do that. So, maybe not everybody, but a whole lot of them will do that. So it will continue because of that, because it means a lot to them. Not necessarily because it means a lot to them, because it will add to their life. It doesn't... all this work doesn't add a thing to my life. But it means so much to every other life, so you do it. If you choose not to do, many yogis, fantastic yogis, they do nothing. They just withdraw. Nothing wrong with them being like that. So, Ramakrishna is setting up a, a trajectory for a projectile that he's shooting. Now this projectile is having a mind of its own, emotions of its own. Now this is dangerous. If you are shooting a rocket to the moon or Mars, if it thinks of Hawaii, Hawaii will be destroyed, <laughs> for sure. So, this is a different dimension, it should never be judged by your understanding, by your emotions, by your values. This is why I said, when you come in touch with the guru, you can either... if you're using him as an inspiration, this will keep happening because somebody will keep dragging you this way, that way. See, many young boys in the yoga center, they all came determined, but then, you know, the girls were pretty. They got married, <laughs> nothing wrong. But I'm saying, like this, if you keep going and whatever small needs are taken care of, no problem. But if you change trajectory because small thoughts and emotions change, best we don't empower you. So I'm... as I said, uh, I'm not yet in the sunset stage, I will become far more colorful as I go, watch it. But right now, heading that way, it's four o'clock in the evening right now, in terms of the day for me. So it is summer time, summer is uh, here, sun is setting at uh, almost 8.45, 9 o'clock in the night, so there's still hours left. But when it's four o'clock in the evening, the intensity of the sun is not like noontime, it's becoming prettier actually, it's becoming nicer. But at the same time, it becomes selective. See, when the sun is up at twelve o'clock, it shines on everybody, everybody, because it's up there. Four o'clock, unless you stick your neck out, it won't shine on you. That's where it's going right now. So, you must decide whether I am an inspiration for you or I am a... what? Friend, philosopher, guide for you? <laughs> or uh, I am a doorway for you that you got stuck in, or I am a destination for you, or I have become your dharma. Time to decide because this is not known time where sun shines on everybody. You need to stick out for it to shine on you.